Welcome. I guess summer has started based on the number of people who are not here. And uh, welcome everyone. As I mentioned, the board meets in the first, sits in the first three rows. At the end of the public session, where anyone from the public could speak for two minutes if you've signed up, we will uh, move into executive session and then the board is, the, our mem board members are the only ones permitted to speak. If anyone from the public has a question or a comment, you need to find a board member who will be sitting in the first three rows, which is part of the purpose of this, except for a few scattered about. Um, and then uh, we have a special guest from the census and we have our city council member, Ben Kalos, who is so eager to speak that he's at the bottom of the stairs. So welcome, council member. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of the uh, members that I see in the audience. Uh, if you are a member of the general public, the folks in the first three rows are community board members. They are volunteers and they do not get paid to be here. Uh, so if we can give them a quick thank you for all their hard work. And the fact that there aren't so many people here today uh, likely means that uh, things are uh, going smoothly. So I'm Council Member Ben Kalos. For those watching online, that's at Ben Kalos. Feel free to touch base. Uh, it's been a busy month. Uh, uh, we actually have some folks from uh, Elro, and Elro will be getting a new gym. Uh, for $6.5 million, they actually have a championship volleyball team and basketball team, but not the men's teams. The women's teams are better at Elro, and uh, so they've been doing really well without actually having a gym, and they will be getting one as part of the new pre-K center. Uh, they will start working on it once that pre-K center goes live. The city's charter revision commission is moving forward. Uh, they, I believe, are voting tomorrow night on some of the language, or tonight, I don't recall. It's tonight, uh, so we hope that uh, some of the ideas that you had made it in. Um, the one I think that you may be most interested in is getting ULERPs as pre-application so you'll be able to have feedback at the beginning of the process instead of getting a yes or no at the end. Uh, this community board played a huge role in the Rockefeller campus. Uh, was anyone on this community board or uh, involved in the community back in the 70s when it first got approved? So basically in the 70s, the city goes bankrupt. All the medical institutions say, hey, we're leaving. And the city says, no, we will give you land over the FDR if you stay. So fast forward 48 years into the, 40, 40 years into the future, this community board approved the expansion of the Rockefeller campus. Something I learned at the ribbon cutting, not to foreshadow, but at the ribbon cutting, the, the architect was actually Raphael Vignoli, uh, who does not have the best reputation, at least for me, because of 432 Park Avenue. Does anyone here, anyone else here not like 432 Park Avenue? Uh, okay, so incidentally, he designed it after a trash can. Uh, so he went to Rockefeller, and they said, we don't want to obstruct the views of the water for the other buildings. So he gave them a design with a 60-foot stilt over their campus, and thank thank them, not, not God, but thank Rockefeller, they said, no stilts, what are you talking about? No, don't do this. So um, I actually got to see the design that that got rejected uh, at that location, but that would have been the first, another building in stilts that we've now defeated. Uh, so the Rockefeller campus just opened, it's a half billion dollar campus, it's going to allow us to compete with Boston. Uh, we've already beaten California as becoming the new silicon location and uh, what have you. Uh, talking about stilts and voids, I want to thank Community Board 8 because you were one of the more supportive community boards. Uh, we got it through the community boards. Everyone had similar uh, concerns about the voids. We, we had a question about what the scope was, and it turned out that the scope was far more limited than we thought it would be, and we weren't able to get the things we wanted, but we entered the public record and entered the public discourse around what we wanted to see in those spaces. Sadly, the City Planning Commission, instead of trying to lower the, the gaps, so right now there's buildings with 150 feet and 160 feet. Now those gaps are gonna be 25 feet maximum if the developer so chooses to try to get away with it. So it's no longer unlimited. They can do them every 75 feet. But the City Planning Commission actually said no, they wanted to do it every 30 feet, not what we were recommending, which was every 12 feet. So that actually passed the council in May, and I think earlier this month became law. Uh, working with Extel, who gave us a pre-K center at 95th Street, we just cut the ribbon on 28 units of affordable housing for people making $35,000 a year. It's 
AMI. It is two bedrooms. If you didn't know about it before, it is now too late to apply. Uh, the uh, rent reforms in Albany, I will let my state colleagues speak to. I think it is a great news. I hope you will join us, and I think you are, as always, uh, participating or what have you in our annual overdevelopment forum. It's on June 27th at 6 p.m. It is at the CUNY Graduate Center. It is sponsored with our Congress member Carol Maloney, Gail Brewer, Keith Power, Senator Liz Kruger, Assembly Member Dick Gottfried, Assembly Member Harvey Epstein, Assembly Member Rebecca Seawright. Uh, we have so many events in the parks. Uh, I'm going to highlight one of them. Uh, anyone familiar with Shakespeare? And in Shakespeare, did they have enough people to play the right genders? No. no. So one of the things that we're doing with the New York Classical Theater is they're doing Oscar Wilde, The Importance of Being Earnest, mm -hmm. but they're doing it two ways. So on certain nights, if you go, the people will be following the, their uh, traditionally cast genders, and on the other nights, they'll be swapping. So this will be worth seeing twice, uh, and I hope you will join us. Uh, there is a lot. Um, I want to thank the uh, Parks Committee, uh, Peggy Price, Susan Avery. We've been fighting uh, to open the Oval for so very, very long. I'd never actually been to the Oval until I went there for a protest. and. Uh, what we, we don't always get exactly what we want, but I think we got some pretty good concessions from the parks. They opened the season for six months, so starting on Father's Day, if you are under 18, it is $10. If you are a senior, it is $20, and for everyone else, it is $100. You can play as much tennis as you want in the air conditioning all season. I'll, men I'll make sure we mention it at CB11. It is a just a, right off the six or the queue, uh, but it is all season until Labor Day. And then starting after Labor Day, you can play in the morning, 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., $10 drop-ins during lunch, or in the late evening at like 10 or 12, which what have you. But they're making a third of the time available, plus so many other things that we'll be digging, digging into a little bit uh, later. Um, we are fresh food boxes starting. There's so many events in our pieces. And I had one other thing. Uh, Will, if you could assist me for one second. There it is. Thank you. I'm going to ask one of our public members uh, to, to come up for a moment, uh, if Judy Schneider could please uh, join me. Uh, so I, I was here in January, and uh, I, I, uh, I believe it is an octogenarian, is, is what folks are called. So one of our board members had become an octogenarian. And uh, what I did not realize is that there were two octogenarian uh, board members on community board eight. Uh, and so it's been a little, it, it is late because it, when was your birthday? January. It was in January, so I'm sorry it took so long. It's uh, the speed of government. Uh, but I wanted to give, uh, I, I, how many proclamations do you have at home? <laughs> Fair enough. So just to add to your, your but large. I Fair enough. So, uh, to actually, we will uh, we will redo this one and get Keith Powers to be added to it because I know that you we we, sh we share you. So uh, that being said, we have a, a proclamation and uh, it's it, there's it is how much time do I have to read everything? Fair enough. Um, give me one second. <laughs> Whereas Judy Schneider began decades of service on the Upper East Side with an empty lot on the southwest corner of East 63rd Street and 2nd Avenue, MTA property that decades ago had been the staging ground for the construction of Lexington Avenue and 63rd Street Station. When the MTA leader wanted to convert it into a parking lot, Ms. Schneider became an activist. She said, quote, that's how a group starts with an issue. The Schneiders lobbied to see the space as a garden, which they cultivated from about 1993 until 2000. The group that they set created to continue servicing the area, the East 60s Neighborhood Association, celebrated its 25th anniversary last fall, whereas Ms. Schneider stressed the couple's agreeable partnership as a main factor of their success. Quote, I know many couples, the woman is very much involved and the husband just doesn't have anything to do with it, or lots of times vice versa, but we're both involved in the same issues, uh, she said. The Schneiders have three children and four grandchildren. They have lived on the Upper East Side for 50 years in the apartment they bought in the first condo building in the city. And there's more whereas and more whereas. Be it known that Councilmember Ben Kale's fifth district gratefully honors Judy Schneider in celebration of her 80th birthday.
Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your service and uh, hope that it is a pleasant summer for all of you. Thank you. you up in groups of three and you have two minutes. <coughs> Valerie Mason. Valerie, you know the drill. Evelyn David and Susie Zackergood. And we only have one more, so you might as well come up as well. Lisa Sample. Sample. Hi, um, I'm Valerie Mason. I'm here in my capacity as the president of the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association. I don't know if you are all aware of this, but on June 3rd, the morning of June 3rd at about 9 o'clock, one of the elevators at the 2nd Avenue subway entrance at 72nd Street decided to stop working mid-movement. Mid there were 17 people stuck on that elevator for over an hour as the fire department tried to uh, extricate them from the top and the MTA ran around trying to figure out what to do. Um, during that hour, they did not stop people from coming up in the other elevators. So 40 to 50 people every 15 minutes were coming into an area where they were trying to open up an elevator. Um, to add to that, there was a street vendor whose cart was right in the midst of the way and so every time they had tried to take a ladder to go into the elevator, which was conveniently exactly perpendicular to the street vendor, they had to go around the cart. This is a real life example of why we cannot have carts in front of these expansive entrances to the subway. Um, it really was a crowded sidewalk. It was too crowded for all of these things. The, the, um, the fire department was there. The EMTs had to park further away. And I, I just don't think, I think this is a real concrete example, and I'm really saying this to the council people. A year and a half ago, when amendments to the street vendor law came up, the, uh, there was actually a recommendation to reduce the, the, uh, the, the distance between the carts and the entrances. And I think these are real life examples of why they shouldn't be there in the first place because you can never tell how expansive an emergency is going to be and lives are at stake. And to block these entrances, it, it just shouldn't happen. Um, finally, the people came out and it was due to the firemen who also said that these are the worst elevators they've ever seen. I'll end on that note. Thank you, Michelle, you know who Valerie is. Okay, next. I, I just want to say Yes, please, thank you. My name is Evelyn David. I'm speaking on the proposed bus lanes for Lexington Avenue. The um, DOT last, on, on the June 5th meeting, I believe it was June 5th, um, was worried about, they said at four o'clock, all the traffic starts getting backed up and they just had a headache about this and that's why they wanna put in bus lanes to make the buses go 25% faster. Okay, so what they really need to do, that the bus traffic at four o'clock is due to the 59th Street Bridge because on 2nd Avenue, you can't get down 2nd Avenue to get on the 59th Street Bridge. So everybody comes, a lot of people come to Lex, and I know this because I live right there on Lexington Avenue and 62, and they go down to Bloomies and they make the turn. Okay, having said that, that's the four o'clock tra traffic. Uh, the irony of what they were talking about, they did say they were gonna experiment for a year, put in the bus lanes and see if it made the traffic worse. Okay, so the next morning, Thursday morning, I come out of my building right there on Lex between 62 and 63. There is, as it turns out, the main gas valve, vas valve for the entire neighborhood, as well as the water mains and the, and the um, sewage, um, uh, um, you know, it's right um, near, near there. So that lane where they're gonna put the bus lane was completely torn up and the experiment is, okay, if we put in the bus lane, let's see what it does to the traffic. Well, the traffic was backed up farther than the eye could see. Now, that's the experiment. It's done. We know if they put the bus lanes in and make Lexington Avenue two lanes, it will be horrible. Okay, the other thing that I asked 
them to please consider they're talking about changing signage on the east side of Lexington Avenue. The only place residents can park on the east side of Lexington Avenue between 62, 63 and 64, and 64 and 65, is after 10 o'clock in the morning. It's metered, everything is metered. The entire west side of Lex is metered commercial, but they want to change those two blocks to just commercial metered. And I know from parking there, and I'll make it really fast, we are, the, the commercial people are out by 10, even before 10. They make their drop-offs and they're gone. Flower guy, he drops off his flowers, he's gone. So that is a plea to them. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. All right. My name is Lisa Semple, and I'm here to ask a question of the community board members. Uh, the entire block between 76th and 77th on the east side of 3rd Avenue is being torn down. Do any of you know who owns that space and to what use it will be put? Is that the Lennox Hill yes, property? Yeah. We don't know what they're intending to do with it. We have invited them to a zoning and development meeting in September. Um, and they're supposed to come with plans for both the hospital site and that particular And you'll site. tell and we us. Don't, we hope. Well, they'll tell <laughs> us. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Okay, and Susie Beverwood? No? Okay. Hi, right. my, my name oh, is. You are there. Yeah. Okay, good. My name is Susie Zuckergood. I live at 200 East 63rd Street. I come here for myself and for the other people in my building. We are the building that Hudson Meridian dropped a large window January 9th, and people are just getting back into our building now. I'd like to find out what the community board, what city government, DOB, the mayor's office, anybody is doing to stop Hudson Meridian. They are violating work permits every single day. They, have, they do not have their hours posted on their wall, and this has been going on since the accident. And they have a partial stop work order and the hours are still not posted. They work illegally after hours. And there was an article in our town, why is this just being brought to you know, everyone's attention now? This has been going on for two and a half years. It's like, welcome to the party. I've been trying to get things done here and to no avail. The borough president's office was looking for people who live in that building. If you send your contact information to the district, to our office, it will get transmitted to the person at, at the borough president's office. I had the construction manager in November of 2016 tell me, wink, wink, about the zoning and about the floors. Well, they're very That's how far back it went. I have no doubt. So if you send your information, we'll put you in touch with the borough president's office in touch with you, and that's a good first step. Okay, one last thing. If they're going to lob off five floors from that building, <laughs> what can be done to protect my building so that this doesn't happen again? Well, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that, but I certainly empathize with you and the plight of the people in your building and surrounding buildings for, because that building is inappropriately designed and built. Um, nevertheless, start with the borough president's office and the board office, and we're working on it. There's a lot of outrage about that. Thank you. Okay, so before we move to the census, um, representative, we have council member Keith Powers is here. Thank you. I don't want to interrupt the census too much because I don't want to talk a little bit about it, but it's so, so important. So thank you for a brief few minutes just to say hello. Um, as you many of you know, I'm City Councilmember Keith Powers representing a portion of CBA, not all of it. I share it with City Councilmember Ben Kalos um, and want to come by before everybody flees for the summer and gets out of town and just say hello and give a couple updates, including the budget that we passed today, actually. I want to talk a little bit about what's in that and some good news for you guys as well. Um, before I do that, I wanted to say 
I'm a little bit late to this, but I want to say a welcome to two new members that I appointed who are really a great addition to this board, Vanessa Aronson and Paul Higgins. Just say, put your hands up. Um, you're getting, we get so many applications for all the community boards. You're getting two really, really good additions to this board, and I've talked to both of them, and they are rolling up their sleeves already. A lot of interest in getting into some of the issues that are really, I think, key to Community Board 8, and so want to welcome them. I also want to say a very big congratulations to a very good, close, personal friend of mine and a member of your board. My friend Greg Kirschbaum just had a, just had a son about a month ago, two months ago, uh, six weeks ago, I think. <laughs> He's a new dad. If he's uh, falling asleep over there, <laughs> somebody, Barry, you got to wake him up. Give him a little bit of a nudge over there. Um, but thank you guys, and congratulations to all, all folks. Um, I was going to talk about three things, maybe four things here quickly. Um, one I want to talk about happened in my district. It was the helicopter incident that happened uh, <clears throat> about a week ago. Um, it was a tra yeah, everything everybody watched the news, but a tragic incident that happened where the helicopter crash landed onto a roof on 52nd and 7th. I go that far west, it's actually my district as well. And it um, has been really, in my tenure here in the city council, only in a year and a half, there's been three accidents in and around Manhattan where a helicopter's been involved. And I've heard from a lot of people in Community Board 8 and Community Board 6, which I have one of the heliports, um, about you know what to do now. A lot of concerns around noise over Central Park and over the Upper East Side about helicopters, but of course a renewed call for safety. And I just wanted to re just to say a few words, which is a um, you know we're we're really saddened by the loss of a person, of an individual here. It was a bad weather event that was going on. Uh, the helicopter took off. It's obviously questions about decisions about whether to take off or not. Um, but it seems like got caught off um, of the route there. And in light of that incident and other things we've talked about for a long period of time about whether non-essential flights should be happening over Manhattan, I'm working with the Congress member to take a look at both the city's role in that, which is Economic Development Corporation, which runs, runs the heliports, and of course the federal agency, the FAA, and ways that we can look at what flight should be going over our neighborhood particularly. And Central Park has come up really often because I have people reach out to my office saying they were in the park and a helicopter came by and is a, becomes a big disturbance. So um, if that's an issue, if that's an issue that you reach out to us about or want to talk about, we can reach out to our office and we'll keep you up, updated on what we're doing around that. Um, but on to news from today, which is around our budget. We voted today on the $92.8 billion budget for the next fiscal year, which um, I thought really met the needs of a lot of New Yorkers, both those who are our most vulnerable residents, but really uplifting a lot of the really you know, keystone things that we care about, schools and libraries and parks and things that our community particularly really, I think, holds up as priorities in that budget process. We also did a number of things to save money for the future because we are in a good, econ a good economy now. I'm hopeful I'll be in my second term, and I am not predicting we're going to be in the, you know, in the same economic standing. So it's really important the city takes a role now in the good days to prepare for those rainy days. So we put $250 million into reserves. So that money we're not going to touch now, we'll, we'll, we'll save to meet some of our obligations later on. We did, um, for the census, we did $40 million in the census for outreach. Why that's important is that is an investment in making sure we get federal, yeah, I think you'll talk a bit about this, but federal money into this, we have, and representation in Congress that we actually have uh, our needs met in the future. That's a down payment on, on that future in the coming years. And my office, of course, is going to be helpful to that effort to make sure every New Yorker is counted. Um, a couple of things that hit close to home was we secured an additional, well, kind of continued, rolled over an additional $40,000 for every community board. You can clap for that. Um, we did that last year, and I actually, I'm not supposed to tell you that. That was kind of up in the conversation again, and there was a community board in Brooklyn who misspent some of the money. But I know my community boards don't do that. And so um, for many of us, it was important. I did hear from board chairs and board members about, uh, about preserving that funding. And in that kind of final conversation on what to fund, I think many of us understand that you're already underfunded. There's so much work to be done here. Constituent services, long-term planning, that taking money away that was supposed to even a one-time payment to the community boards, 
we have the money, we should continue to fund it. So that money was in there. Second, um, we, I, my office allocated money to help fund an urban planner to help with the land use function. So this, this um, I want to give a shout out to them. They came to me and said, Keith Powers, you better fund this. And I listened, and I did. Um, and then finally, both myself and Councilman Kalos um, have been funding and are continuing to fund money to um, allow people to live stream the community board meetings, which I, I really mean this. I get people who like say things to me about <coughs> community board meetings, and they clearly were watching it from home or live streaming community board six two. Um, so um, we're we're really happy to make a you know investment in community boards across the city, but particularly community board eight, and make sure you guys can continue to do the hard work that you do. And you guys should say are really an exceptional community board who work your butts off. So you deserve those. You you've earned it. You've earned all those extra resources. <laughs> and to the bad guys in Brooklyn, <laughs> I had nothing to say to them. Um, I just want to, and the, the couple other things I want to say is we made two investments that, I, that I'm particularly proud of. One and two historic all-time highs in terms of increases in funding, libraries and parks. And I, to me, those are, you can please clap for those. Um, these, these are personal to me because I've always viewed places like that as public spaces. They're egalitarian. Anybody can use them. They are public spaces like the, for people that really need places to go. For children, libraries can serve as their own after-school program, places to do homework, places to learn to read. For so many New Yorkers, they go to our public libraries as places where they can find new things, you know, new ways to educate themselves. Um, we have programs. I'm the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee. The New York Public Library does services for people who are incarcerated. Um, they do for people who are learning language for the first time. Um, they really important places, and our investment into those is really a symbol that every New York, it's not, it's not things that are just for one community, it's a really across the board raises in their budget so that they can meet the needs. And they were also, in the original budget, things that were on the chopping block. They were supposed to get cuts. And so we really, as a council, fought to put money into them rather than take it away because every community has a library, every community has a park they cherish. Those are places for all of us, and we're really proud of that money. I think we're doing $43 million of new money into the city parks for better maintenance workers or gardeners and other programs that we do in the city parks, and it's a $33 million for our libraries. And I actually also added in uh, a quarter of a million dollars for our local libraries to help, as actually I do participatory budgeting, where you get to vote on capital funding. I let you guys decide, and you guys, so I shouldn't even take credit for it, you guys should take credit for um, putting about a quarter million dollars for our libraries local here to help modernize them, put new technology into them so that people who go there have access to the latest and the newest technology. So they, if you voted in my participatory budgeting, thank you for putting libraries at the top of that list. Um, and just a few other items that won in participatory budgeting. Wagner Middle School is getting new bathrooms. That was one of the top items. If you have kids in there, yeah, there you go. I love Wagner. Um, PS59 is getting, just a little bit south of here, is getting auditorium upgrades. They're getting a really beautiful new green roof. So if you are a parent who's sending your kid to 59 and Wagner, this is a big win for you. But either way, they're great schools. PS6 is getting new cameras, security cameras that they've really been asking for. Hunter, both the college and the high school are getting beautiful, beautiful new renovations. Um, they are going to be getting uh, like uh, New, audit, new spaces for recreational activity, new, uh, really a new nice facade, uh, and a number of other upgrades in there. And that, a lot of that is because people came out and voted in our process to fund those things, some others that we were able to pick up on our own. Um, I don't want to take up too much time. I just want to, I just will say two more things. One is I passed two new laws that are going into effect shortly. Um, they're both in part of my committee in the Criminal Justice Committee. One is um, access to health care in our city jails is Pitiful. People make medical appointments to go see a doctor. Sometimes they have to go to Bellevue, never get taken to those appointments. We have people who have take sick call, which is to say, I don't feel well today. No, the no-show rate because they're not presented to the clinic is is pitiful. It's we had a hearing on this, and we've really made an effort to to improve that process. So somebody, if somebody's not taken to the clinic when they're not feeling well, somebody misses in a critical appointment. There are now new levels of accountability. We at the council will know when that's not happening. We'll be able to hold them accountable. It was a real fight. 
we were fighting with the mayor's office over this, but we passed it the other day. It will have meaning to people who really need critical services when they're behind in our city jails. So that is um, really important. And the second part sort of related to that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and the second one is kind of related, but it's if you, if you are in a city jail today, you can call 311. And, and they, they have a really high amount of free one calls. If you're not, if you want to file a grievance to say, I'm not getting appropriate services that I need or something like that, and people really do, that actually doesn't count towards a formal, there's actually a formal filing a grievance process. You can call 311 and that doesn't go anywhere. It goes to an office but it doesn't actually start any process. So we mandated now that similar to healthcare, we're gonna now mandate that that actually service happens. If you call 311, which thousands of calls every day to 311 from our city jails, if you call that, you actually start a process, a formal process that didn't start. So for a lot of people they complain, I don't, I'm not getting things I need while I'm here, services I need, they call 311, it would go to nowhere, which is my experience with 311 sometimes too, but, um, but now to also accountability. So those are going to the mayor's office and they're gonna be signed, I believe, into law shortly. Um, and the last thing I want to say is, I, I am very proud of this, but I really want to give credit to our state elected officials. Um, the rent laws in Albany, that the rent reform that was happened in Albany, is going to be is one of the most meaningful laws that will happen in my district while I am here. When law changes, I should say, I grew up in a rent stabilized apartment. My parents still live in a rent stabilized apartment. I rep represent rent regulated tenants. I represent Stives in town, which has been one of the epicenters of this fight. And um, I'm really, really proud of our colleagues in the state government. I just want to give them a particular shout out because they went up to Albany. They didn't come back and say, we couldn't get it done. Politics stood in the way. The real estate board stopped us again. They went out and they got us something that to me, I can now look at my constituents and say, your future is secure here in New York City. You're not gonna get, you're not gonna get evicted. There's not a fear of a law that's it's gonna be used against you. And I really think that this is going to have, I know we talk a lot about long-term planning in this neighborhood, in our community, how to preserve the ability for people to stay here. That's going to be, to me, the most meaningful change that we can make in the city or in the state to protect people. And I don't see any of the state elected officials there, but I know they have representatives here, but Liz Kruger and Dan Cord and Rebecca Seawright and Brad Hoyleman and all people that represent us are my heroes because they, they, are, they went up there, they fought the good fight, and they came back. And I'm really, really excited about that. Um, and I, you know, I just will say, I used to work for Liz Kruger, and um, she's been in this fight for a very, very long time. She went out to places that I never heard of throughout the state of New York to win back seats so that they could get to this day. And I, I, I don't know if it's your text, but I text Liz, and I said, congratulations. She said to me, this is the proudest day I've, that I've had as a state senator, and I'm really, really grateful for Liz Kruger and her fight to make this day happen. Um, I'm just going to leave it at that, but I'll say we have actually tomorrow, we're hosting our mobile district office hours, which you do every month. We'll be at the Yorkville Library on 79th Street. If you want to, you can obviously always pull me aside or call my office on any issue, but if you want to come by, say hello, keep us company, or want to come talk about an issue, we'll be there from 12 to 2 tomorrow. And of course, Jenna from my office is here in the back if you have anything you want to talk about in the meantime. But I can take a couple of questions. I know you want to move on to the census. Yes. Uh, my name is Sharon Paul. I was under the impression, circling back to uh, the helicopter issue, mm -hmm. I was under the impression that to the extent practicable, their flight paths had to be uh, along the water. Mm -hmm. And not cross over. I mean, not for. Yes. I mean, you know, I mean to, to to cross over, but not to uh, you know take long you know flights down from say one end of Manhattan to another for both Manhattan as well as Roosevelt Island. Is it possible yeah. that you can clarify mm -hmm. the overall rules for? Uh, flight pass for helicopters. So I'll tell you what I know, and mostly most of this is in the wake of what happened a week or two ago. Uh, for starters, I'll just say that the, the route that I understand that this helicopter took was from 34th Street down, going around Manhattan, going up the west side, and in that process, I, I think because of the weather and fog and things like that, and I think because of the, um, of the way that the, the pilot was trained and kind of turns out to fly, um, ended up where he did, and was, well, that was not the planned route. Um, Trump Tower is a no-fly area around there. 
and I understand other parts of Manhattan, you can fly over with the permission, if you get permission to do that, and th those are in the flight paths of LaGuardia and some of the other airports, so if you want to go over Manhattan, you need some prior permission to that. The other thing I'd add in, this is really a particular challenge when we're talking about regulating helicopters in New York City, is there's a, and this one included, was destination and origin can be in New Jersey. So even as we try to capture um, some of the ones that or originate or, or end up in our, um, in our heliports and our, in our helipads, um, there's a whole component of this that comes over Jersey. That's where we need the federal government to be involved in it, and that's been one of the, the, the difficult tasks. We have a little more control, obviously, if they're stop, you know, starting and stopping in, in the city, but in this case, um, he was going to New Jersey. He was going back to New Jersey, and that's why we need the Congress as well. But I've been trying to get the exact pathways where they're allowed, but as I understand it, um, to go over where he was and was, wasn't supposed to be there, you need approval from the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Lorraine Brown, co-chair of the Census Task Force. Council Member Powers, I want to thank you for your commitment to the Census 2020 and for the $40 million. That said, we're having a Census Task Force meeting tomorrow at 6.30 in the district office and hopefully you'll send someone there to okay. join us. Sure, that'd be great, and thank you for that. And I, I said a little bit of the census, but um, we look at the data and we, you know, our district, our new neighborhood, you know, many people participate, but a lot of people still don't. And it's gonna be online, I think, this year. Am I right about that? It's gonna be online this year, but if you don't respond, you're gonna get mail and door knocks and things like that, and you'll, you'll fill in the rest. I'm stealing your thunder, but, um, but really important. And I know sometimes it feels like one of those things you can put off. It, it's meaningful to our budget, things we can fund here. And like I said, it also matters in terms of our representation in Congress and many other things. So thank you for all your work you're doing on that. Yeah, um, as a rent regulated uh, tenant, uh, I live in a five-story walk-up. Mm. I happen to have a landlord who's an honest guy. Mm. There really are some. Uh, the changes in the laws are, for the most part, very appropriate. Uh, but some of them are payback. Mm -hmm. And the one that concerns me is the $15,000 yeah, cap. Yeah. If a boiler has to be replaced or a roof to limit what they can get, Rather than have competent oversight of the estimate of the job, the costs, whether it really needs to be done, you know, we're, we're, we're substituting tough laws for tough oversight. We've got to yeah, keep an yeah, eye on this. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. It's got a lot of attention. So in the rent regulation package, there were two items that were about how a landlord can invest in an apartment or their building at whole. One's a major capital improvements, which is you can make a, do a boiler upgrade, you can do other things in the building, and pass the cost along to the resident, to the rent regulated residents, or to the market rate resident, get it reflected in their rent. The second is individual apartment uh, improvements, which is you, somebody moves out of the apartment, you do an improvement on it to modernize it, you get to reflect that in the rent as well. And Albany made a shift, and a big shift, in terms of those two, which is raised, and I, I, I admit that I had some concerns about similar to yours, which is make sure we don't disincentivize somebody from putting money into their, and investing. And I live in Stives in town, we, get, we have the most MCIs of anybody on earth, I think there's like 30 in right now. Um, they, one of the complaints has been they don't really disappear. They end up in your base rent and all your rent increases are based on that, those increases. Um, so reform was way overdue, in, in some manner or form. And on the IAIs, you never had to actually provide receipts or billing to show that the, so let's say you said I did $100,000 of kitchen and bathroom upgrades on an apartment, you never actually had to submit documentation to anybody that you did that. And so we had a concern, I had particularly had a concern that I've raised with the state agency that people are, you could be easy to falsify. You just submit it and you just hope somebody never challenges you. And if they challenge you, you submit, then you have to submit it, but nobody, that process for submitting and challenging it is only the best and well-resourced tenants can really do that and tenants associations like the one I, where I live. But um, they, they were right to do something about it. There was a big debate about whether they went too, whether they went too far, or what the consequences will be. I will say I have had a conversation with the city housing agencies and we have some programs where if a landlord doesn't continue to 
do like upkeep on the building. We have an alternative enforcement program where we go in and do the fixes and charge them and hand them the bill. Um, we're looking at some of those programs and things that we've subsidized in the city, housing programs we've subsidized in the city to make sure that we have also have appropriate ways to respond to things like that. Um, but I, you know, you, your, your calculation might be right where such bad policies for such a long time cause people to want to swing that pendulum back far. Um, I will say, just on the broader topic, and I think you would agree with this, like those were two areas that needed some attention because of the egregious nature of the way they were being treated as profit areas for a very long time. Um, I, I have some of those concerns too about which, how far they went and if, whether there'll be consequences. So that's why I've kind of started the conversation with the city agencies to make sure, at least in my district, that we have alternatives to um, enforcement and things like that. One more thing. Oh, I just wanted to ask you, Keith, about Lenox Hill Northwell. Mm -hmm. Have they reached out to you at all? I got a presentation on the plan, I think some, somewhat around the time that they went public with it. I, I think I spoke at the 77th Street Association, had a meeting on one part of that plan, which is the Third Avenue component where the Atlantic Grill, I think it was where the Atlantic Grill was. Um, look, I think it's pretty out of scale right now. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not ideologically opposed to a hospital looking at their facilities and saying, we have to do some modernization here. We have to treat our patients in a 21st century manner. I think when you look at the plan right now, I'm just giving my honest opinion. I think when you look at the plan right now, it's pretty, pretty big, pretty ambitious. And I think what's important to me is that you are able to do things to be able to keep up your hospital modernized. Because if they know, like in the worst case scenario where they can't serve anymore, you're, you're going to see, a, it, we're talking about a massive, massive project there to replace it. So I, I, I see the need to, in, to invest in the property. I think we have to make sure that it's in scale and it's in context and it's balanced and we're not doing something that's um, way out of line. And I've been talking to some of the neighbors around Park Avenue on the streets nearby. I've heard a lot of concerns and then also about the scale of it, but also what the construction is going to be like for 10 years or eight years when... Well, I don't care about the construction. We all live with how long did it take to build the queue? <laughs> What I'm concerned about is the neighborhood context, yeah, especially along. But the neighbors are concerned about the construction, and I look. There's also I, I just want to say something too. There's also opportunity. Like there's opportunity to. I, I think the subways on 77th Street, those stations are crowded and narrow. Those sidewalks are narrow. There's opportunities to improve that traffic and parking on those side streets around the uh, deliveries. Bad. Like those are opportunities in a plan to clean things up that are just. We just des desperately need or desperately needed, and things that the residents who live nearby have raised to me, even a year and a half of just things they're concerned about. But the, I think the two things I've heard the most of concerns is height, scale, density, and um, and the uh, construction uh, for those who live potentially like right across the street or next to a building, and two things that I've flagged very early on for. Uh, for Northwell about things that are going to be, I'm sure, things I, I, things I know you guys are going to raise, the borough president and myself are going to raise, and things that would be wise for them to be looking at way before they get into a EULA process and a certification. But I am happy to be with anybody that has really particular concerns about it um, because it's, it, the best case for me is to be able to bring back real concerns from the residents and the neighbors to say these are the things they're thinking about. So they're, they can be addressed early, not not when we're in the, when the clock's running at CB8 and my clock and things like that. Because if you want to talk about it or any neighbor wants to talk about it, I'm happy to find time to meet, hop on the phone. CBA should have a seat at that table. You guys always have a seat at the table, of course. And I was going to say, with, with respect to that, uh, they had made it clear at the public meeting that despite the fact that they'll be doing a zoning map amendment, that they will not be, they're hoping it won't be subject to mandatory inclusionary housing. So they want to build a massive tower. And I asked their land use Whether it is subject to? They, they were hoping that even though there will be a zoning map amendment, that they would not be subject to MIH. Which I, 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 you have to I don't want to litigate this right now. I, I believe I was told the opposite. And I think yeah, it was a, their, their land use, I asked them a question. I said, do you plan on doing the affordable within yeah, the tower yeah, yeah. or off-site? And they said, we're hoping to not be subject to mandatory inclusionary housing. I have to go back. We have, we, in our meeting, I, I, and I don't want to say something that I'm going to have to, I, I thought we had a conversation about MIH and 
um, and how and whether it would apply there. And I, you know, with our land use council, I'll follow up with you on that. Or if you want to chat about it, I'll follow up because I have to go back and remember exactly what they said. But it came up in our presentation, I think proactively it was raised as, and I, my recollection was they were saying the other, other, the other way, but um, I have to, I don't want to say that and walk it back, but. Condo tower on Park Avenue, you're going to put the affordable we, Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah. I'll come, I can come talk to, can I take one more? I'll take one more. Right. You can about the bus lanes. <laughs> on Lex, can you have any input into this problem? This, 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 there, you know, there is a solution right now on Lex. It works. Yeah. Why would they mess? Don't they're going to create something worse? If you're talking about anyway. the bus, the bus line yeah. again, yes. could you do that? Um, Email us no, and talk to Jenna. Uh, we'll okay. talk about. Who is it back there? Jenna, right there. Right right there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll show. And Jenna here. comes to our meetings. Yes. And, so thank you. Thank okay. You thank much. you guys, and have a good summer. If I don't see everybody. <laughs> Right. Hi, everyone. I just want to first thank Mrs. Brown, who has been my partner in the census here, Community Board 8. She is astonishing. I hold her up as an example to the other boards that I work with here in Manhattan. And I'm thrilled to be partnering with all of you here as we look to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place in April 2020. Um, I share, I'm going to talk just for literally five minutes and then take a few questions. We're going to talk about how the census is important, it's safe, it's easy, and we're hiring. So first, important. As our council member mentioned, the census determines the division of $675 billion in federal funding to the states. Um, those of you who are looking at your tablets, there's a... There's a, um, a sheet that mentions um, the New York, some statistics from recently from, from New York per George Washington University. You can see that all of your favorite federal programs are on there. It's Medicaid, it's Medicare, it's SNAP, it's WIC, it's Title I, it's free breakfast and lunch in schools, it's Section 8 housing, and I could go on and on about how important those dollars are to our communities. If we do not have an accurate count, then we will not, in New York State, get the full complement of federal funding that we need and deserve to support the community and everyone in it. Um, so those are the dollars. On the representation side, the count will determine how many state representatives we have here in New York both in the U.S. House of Representatives and in our state legislature. It will determine congressional districts and voting districts, um, so, and school districts. So that's a little bit about why it's important. So it's safe. Everyone who works for the census has a badge like this. Um, this badge means that they've sworn and taken an oath that they will protect all of the information that they are privy to as part of the census the entire Census Bureau. The oath is taken for life, um, and it means that if for any reason there was a breach of data, and if I were involved, I could be thrown in federal prison for up to five years and fined $250,000. So we take this very seriously. In addition, the census data, all census data, we take data in from other agencies. We do not give it back out. We spit out statistics. So we take in information about people who are unemployed, we spit out the unemployment rate. All of our data is protected from other government agencies by Title 13. Title 13 was put into place in 1954. You will hear Julie Menon, who will come here, I understand, in the fall, and I'll follow up with, with some specifics with her. And the fact is that she will say Title 13 is ironclad. No other government agency, not ICE, not Homeland Security, not the IRS, can access the data from the Census Bureau. So that's just to tell you it's safe. And I included in on your tablet, you've got this handout on the census and confidentiality. So that's just something to look at. Um, in terms of 
that the census, before I go to the census is easy, I just want to say the other handout that I included was this why we ask. There are some of these out, out on the table out there, but why we ask is every question that's on the census. So this ties into the fact that the census is easy because it's the short form, it's the same form we used in 2010, we're not sending anyone to the long form. If anyone says to you, I filled out a really long form recently, they did the American Community Survey, which is something that we do on an annual basis with random participants. So everyone must fill out the census. It's filled out, we're gonna be counting 330 million people in 140 million households, um, including everyone in New York City. And I hope that you know we'll hear forthcoming from, from the city how they are going to what their plan will be to spend that $40 million effectively to help aid in this effort. My job from the federal government is to make sure that you understand how you will be counted and how to participate. So in terms of how we are gonna ask, invite everyone to respond, in March of 2020, March 12th of 2020, we will open an online database you will be able to respond to the census in 12 different languages online for the first time ever. You will also be able to call on the phone and you'll be able to call 12 in 12 languages, dedicated phone numbers in French, Spanish, Russian, um, Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, I'm not gonna say the Tagalog, I can give you a full, I can give you the full list. I don't have it by memory yet, but I should. Um, so it will be easy to complete online and on the phone. And because we're taking it in online and by phone, we will be able to have digital results for the director of the census in the city, Julie Menon. She will be able to see where people are not responding and then be able to push into those neighborhoods. Right, the last time mm -hmm. I think um, we had a report on the census, people understood that the mayor would be able to send out people specifically to, I mean, to specific addresses, but that's not correct. So, the only people who are gonna, no who should be knocking on doors to collect information are people who work for the census because they've taken the oath and they've sworn to protect that information. So the city hall won't have access to individual residents or apartments? They, I can't speak for what the, what the mayor will do or the city will do. I can only speak for the fact that the only people who can take in, who can do the knock, right? If you don't respond by phone and you don't respond online, then your fourth mailing that'll come to your household will be a paper form. So for those of you who are, are attached to the paper, it will come. You will have the paper form. Um, if you don't respond in any of those three ways, you will get the knock, knock, knock. And the only people who can do that knock, knock, knocking, which is why we are so busy taking people into our online database to hire, are people who work for the federal government. If anyone comes to your door and knocks on your door and starts asking you things about your social security number or your bank account information, they are not from the Census Bureau, and you should let us know, or the, you should let the government know because we will then follow up with them. And, and trust me that unfortunately, that will happen. Um, so in terms of it being easy, that is, so it'll be online, by phone, by mail, and then knock, 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 follow up. So we're hiring. We're hiring on 2020census.gov backslash jobs, I left outside um, a number of these brochures about being a census taker. There are actually two different offices that are gonna be in Manhattan that are also gonna hire in northern and southern Manhattan. Recruiting people, people for IT, it they're boots on the ground operations. Where you will probably see retail, like kiosks and other things, that's something that that Julie Menon is going to be working on. The census this time around does not have the same stimulus funding we had in 2010, so you won't see that sort of effort from us, but we will have these two offices helping to support the census. So that's, I also wanted to mention, because I hear that it was discussed recently in this, 
in, at this community board level was that, that it's the issue about the citizenship question. So right now, the citizenship question is on the census. It is part of the form. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments on April 23rd, and we are due to hear that decision sometime very shortly, because as many of you may have read about, the census does go to print over the summer. So that decision will be coming out. Whether or not the, the citizenship question is on the census, we encourage everyone to complete the form to the, to the best of their ability and to fully answer every question uh, for, this, for the sanctity of the data involved. Um, so that's what I can share. Once we, once we know about, about the question, then you know, we will all know whether it is there or not. We are out in every community. There is a partnership specialist staff right now of over 90 people scaling to 250 in our New York region, which is from all of New England, New York, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico, but with a great concentration here in the city. We, we have many populations we're targeting. I have a literal, like many United Nations of colleagues who are out there in the Haitian Creole community, the Indo-Caribbean community, the Polish community, just on and on, trying to reach populations that are harder to count. Um, but we welcome every trusted voice, and as community board members and members of the greater community who are interested in community issues, you are all people who are census ambassadors who can help us to encourage people to complete the form. Thank you very much, and you'll be back before. I will be back, and I will also be, I know, um, and I will also be outside for a few minutes. Um, oh, we have a question, Liz. Or a couple questions. In uh, other languages, because I would really like to be posting that information in Chinese, Korean, Japanese, because we have a lot of international students. I don't want us to get undercounted for how many people are in our community, and we need it. We need the information in multiple languages. So right now we have some information in Spanish. I'm told that we will have, we will actually have, in terms of filling out the form, there will be support in 59 different languages online. So that information will be forthcoming. It is not available yet. Um, I haven't even seen the physical form yet. Like, you know, certain things are just, things are moving quickly, but certain things haven't been distributed yet. Yes. I was told I was not at the meeting that Julie Menon said that we can leave up to three questions blank without it being a problem. So if somebody is uncomfortable, if we are going to have the citizenship question, that you can leave it out. Do you agree? Is that something? So I'm here from the federal government, and I can tell you that we do not know. If there are questions left blank, we do not know what the threshold will be for people who will call and follow up or knock, knock and follow up on those forms. We do not know how many questions one may be able to leave blank and what they may be. So for example, there are certain questions that are unique identifiers. Some people have said to me, well, if you're only counting how many people, right? We count documented, undocumented, permanent legal resident citizens. If you're only counting, then why do you need my name? Well. I need to make, we, you know, the Bureau needs to make sure we're counting everyone once, only once, and in the right place. So name is a unique identifier. So it is unclear, and there have been no directives about how many questions that one could possibly leave off without having follow-up. Yeah, I spoke to Julie Menon, and she also, I mean, it's obviously up to the federal government, but there is no security in not answering questions. If you don't answer questions, there's no guarantee the census form will be ca that you'll be counted. And so it's really a concern. I think we'll get more. You said something different a few weeks ago. We'll have more information as we get closer to the census, and Julie will be here in September, so you can ask her again then. Any other? Right, but in terms of process, it will come from from yeah, from you guys from us. It's just concerning that wrong information was already given to us. It is. I don't. I'm not. What uh, my recollection of the discussion is that there was an acknowledgement that that was 
perhaps appropriate, but it wasn't a guarantee and it wasn't insured and nobody really knew how to respond to the citizenship question. And one of the concepts expressed was not having, not what was being allowed to leave out three questions, but talking, I've had lengthy conversations with Jolie and Julie and they both say do not do that because there is no guarantee that those quest that your form will be counted and we have to be counted. But what I did learn, and you could correct me, Jolie, is that the citizenship question, it's not citizens and undocumented people. It's citizens and everyone who isn't a citizen. So it doesn't point you out if you say no that it means that you're an undocumented person living here. Um, it just means that you're not a citizen. And that may in itself provide some comfort people to are people. Still be afraid. Of course, but if it's on the census, there's nothing we could do, and the risk of not filling it out is so significant in terms of losing money and losing representation that people somehow have to be convinced that they need to answer it. And maybe if, if, they, if there's an understanding, it doesn't mean that you're undocumented, that that will provide some kind of security. I, I don't know, it's just so much rides on this. And, and given some of the information that has come out about the question, it's, it's so, it's unfortunate in that people are scared is really unfortunate and so that's why we're ha that's why I've asked Jolie to come a number of times and Julie so that people from the community could come and credit to Lorraine I was going to mention in the chair report but I might as well mention it now is that she did workshops for people to come and fill out applications to work for the census she did it at, at the Isaac Center and it had forms printed out in different languages, Spanish and Chinese and Russian, so that people would be enticed and, and willing to come. It was very well organized. There were a lot of people who showed up. I know Lorraine has statistics. So all of this drive from the beginning, what Julie told me was in 2010, neither the city nor the state put any resources behind the census. And the, the number of people who responded was really not great. So the city and the state are putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into enticing people and, and um, making people understand how important it is to actually fill it out. Cause? Do you go by legal name or what is commonly, I could go by my legal name or what I'm known as, so how do you check? You know, and if there's any question about duplication, we definitely reach out and contact people. There's a whole, um, there's a whole, there are two different phone-in centers that also do due diligence follow-up, um, but it's, that's a question you can, you know, honestly, we now have this wonderful phone line, so when the census comes, you can call in, and they will give you instructions on just how to complete your name. But Dave? I could go oh. by my legal name, and everybody knows me as cause, and I could get a knock on the door. <laughs> now we want to know. No, 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 it's the same last name, if right? It's, no, and no, if, no, it's, no, if it's at the address, then it will be counted at that address. It's that residence. So it's it's one. It's per it's per household. You're counted per household. Dave, yeah, uh, this uh, citizenship question is obviously an incredibly hot issue. I find it astonishing that a federal official doesn't can't point to a written policy as to whether failure to answer a question will have that thrown out or not. I, I can't accept that verbal opinions on a helpline or from what you say or Julie Menon says is, is adequate. There are rules. Their administrative law has policies and regulations, and there must be a clear-cut answer, yes or no. And why, what, what's going on? Why are we not getting a, a simple uh, explanation of what the law is? Will those, if, if you, people leave that bl blank, uh, will that be counted? How can we leave this kind of a question unanswered and only given verbal answers on a, a helpline to individual people? I, I just, I'm, I find it very, very distressing. You're right. Everyone is encouraged to fill out the complete But that's not form. my question. My question you is, know what? what is the policy? What is the government's policy? Now. Policy should be in writing. There may be, as we get closer, right. and when we know whether the question is on the census or not, there may be specific policies that are developed. And things in Washington are a little bit different now than they were I'll say. 10 <laughs> years ago, and that may provide an explanation <laughs> for that yeah. as well. Lorraine? What I was going to say is what you just said. Things in Washington are different now. And I think um, the present administration is waiting for the decision from SCOTUS 
And once that decision is made, then they will set policy and we will all have a better idea. I can tell you that as soon as the decision comes out, I will be on a national partnership call with 700 other people who will be briefed on this. And this is a question that, come, that has come up. It's not that people aren't raising this question. And hopefully, I will have a better answer for you when we speak in September. The census happens in April. But you're right. We should, we should know. And there should be an approach of, of what people should do with the, with the census and how to. And it shouldn't hinge on, on a decision from the Supreme Court about censuses, because there may be another question that somebody chooses not to answer. Is their uh, census response going to be thrown out? No. Yes or no? We don't know. Let's, we have 10 months or nine months. So let's see. Excuse me. So let's see what ha Michelle. So let's see what happens when we get when we get closer. Anything else that's while she, while Jolie is here? When she can ask, ask people. But what, this isn't the first census ever done in America. Was there a policy in a previous census yeah, regarding question. whether questions yeah. you, you left out any three? Or I mean, <coughs> was there no policy then? And so the verbal instruction that if you didn't answer three, <coughs> were correct on the last census? census? I can't speak to 2010. I can speak to 2020. And hopefully, I will have a more informed answer for you. But right now, just like if people, I'll tell you, just like if people apply to work for the census, there are certain cutoffs that if you apply and you have certain, you may have certain triggers on your record that you would not be hired to work for the Census Bureau. I can't tell you what those are either. Let's just wait and, and see as we get closer. Um, but I, we all, I think everyone in this room realizes how important it is and how much answers to these questions that you're asking really count. So Julie Menon will come and Jolie will come back and maybe the state will come. And we have, um, fortunately, Lorraine and Rebecca yeah. are working really hard on this. Thank, Thank you so you much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Second, any objections? OK, the, the agenda is adopted. Any amendment to the minutes? Rebecca? I have two. The first is in the vote tally with the name Street Life. Those votes weren't, aren't on the uh, sheet. And then I know that the parks and waterfront um, resolution was only one line, but that one line also isn't included in the minutes. So if those could be fixed. Um. With those corrections, any, anything else to the minutes? OK, then the minutes are adopted. Let's hear from um, Manhattan Borough President's Office. Yolanda, welcome. Yes, come on. Or not, if you choose. No, no. No? Oh, no, then you have to come up? No, no, no. no that one? <laughs> this come one, on. come on up, they're saying. You're a TV star. Uh, that one doesn't have to be good. Oh, it doesn't work? No, it picks up the sound for the Oh. Hello. I'm Yolanda Rodriguez from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer's office. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just a few things uh, uh, to follow up on the presentation made by Jolie. Uh, Gail will be holding a press conference this Friday in her office at 1 Center Street, uh, convening the Manhattan's Complete Count Committee uh, to introduce its members and to, annou to announce her census count initiative funding. Uh, this RFP for the census 2020 complete count will focus on targeting, elevating the, the numbers of un, undercounted communities. So, you know, undercounted means underfunded and underrepresented. So it's really important that we get the word out there throughout the city. Um, uh, the pre board president wanted me to uh, talk about a little bit about the public hearing that we had last week on June 11th around the borough-based uh, jails. Uh, people from community boards uh, CB1 and 3 came out to testify and voice their opinions about that. Uh, it's anticipated that the, uh, the de Blasio administration will file the ULERP very soon, at, irrespective of what these community boards feel and think about these borough-based boards. And Gail is committed to working with the CBs to ensure that it, uh, if this proposal moves forward, that the most egregious aspects of, of the land use matter is scaled back. I also wanted to announce that uh, Ju July 1st will be the start of the Manhattan Paper Challenge. 
uh, the Pratt Paper Company, who's sponsoring this uh, program or initiative, uh, will weigh tonnage every month with the Department of Sanitation as to who is doing their, the best job in so far as collecting recyclables. Also wanted to send a congratulations to the tenants of Ol Ohms Tower um, on their victory against the mayor and NYCHA. Uh, NYCHA rescinded the application for the development of the infill, so I want to send my congratulations and our congratulations to the board and to the tenants at Holmes and, and this wonderful victory. Also, yes, absolutely. You know, it just goes to show you that the voice of the community always prevails. Um, also, uh, a congratulatory note to uh, friends of the Upper East Side in their challenge against 1059 Third Avenue as well. And Susie, if you're still here, uh, the resident who spoke earlier at 200, from 200 East 63rd, if you're not here, uh, what's that? No, I <laughs> yeah, I don't see her, see her either. But um, we did have a resident that we reached out to from that uh, uh, rental building who we're helping out with that as well. Uh, but uh, as far as the challenge is concerned, it is pending, and no news is good news as far as I'm concerned, as far as we're concerned. So hopefully that, w that investigation will be pending. And that's all for now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, other, other elected official reps? Or elected officials reps? Come on up. It's very quiet in here, I guess, because there aren't a lot of people, but no talk. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you as well. Uh, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Terrell Brock, and I'm a community liaison from uh, State Senator uh, Jose Serrano's office. I hope we're, we're doing well. Uh, the senator has been uh, very busy up in Albany, and we've uh, we were able to help, help pass the strongest uh, rent reform and tenant protection laws in the history of our state. And the center is especially pleased that included in the package are provisions from his legislation to eliminate the vacancy bonus, which currently allows landlords of stabilized units to raise their rents by uh, up to 20% uh, after vacancy, rapidly transforming a rent regulated apartment into uh, one that is market rate and decontrolled. The, Re reforms that we, we you'll pass also include an end to uh, vacancy decontrol, which removed units that uh, become uh, that, that became vacant from uh, stabilization. If the rent reached a, a certain rate, or if the tenants' income reached two hundred thousand or higher, uh, this led to the deregulation of more than three hundred thousand uh, units. And we're also able to pass a, a driver's license for immigrants. Um, some benefits are uh, allowing immigrants access. Uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, allowing uh, immigrants access to license will make our roads safer, lower insurance rates, boost our economy by generating more than 50 million in annual revenue through taxes and fees. Uh, ensure that uh, these hardworking New Yorkers can drive to work, school, medical appointments, and emergency uh, situations, uh, providing them uh, easier access to uh, services without fear um, of arrest or uh, the. Uh, Portation. And has also helped foster uh, trust between immigrant communities and law enforcement, making them more likely to report crime and cooperate with the police, as well as encouraging them to be uh, um, active um, participants in civic and com community life. And, and, um, and uh, does anyone have any questions? Okay, great. Um, hope everybody has a good night. Thank you. And if anybody, well, well, okay. <laughs> okay good, good, good. <laughs> Hi there, it's Audrey filling in from Mike. I'm glad to be here for Senator Liz Kruger and to get to see you all again. As has been mentioned, everyone, particularly Liz, is thrilled about the rent regulations being strengthened um, in the state, for the entire New York State. Also, very important, the Community Climate Protection Act has passed the Senate, and we're really hopeful that it's gonna get through the Assembly and it will be signed by the governor. This is an act that would put New York ahead of the game in terms of environmental and climate issues, uh, really protecting the, the, the state and the world, moving from uh, fossil fuels to all energy renewal uh, capacities by the year 2050. And also, Liz wants it known that obviously it's also a jobs program. 
in addition, because it will be creating new jobs and renewable energies. So we're very excited about that. Also, just today, you know, in the, in the Senate, they're still in progress. Things are happening even now. It's probably going to go through until tomorrow. And just about a half an hour ago, the Senate did pass automatic voter registration. And as you may know, New York State is number 47 in voter registration numbers. So you talk about being worried about the census. When you look at those numbers and think about people signing up and registering, we really have a lot of work to do. So the automatic voter registration has been improved. We fully expect that it's going to go into the assembly and the governor will sign it. A lot is still happening. As Liz says, it's kind of like a high school student or a college student who waits till the end of the semester to pull all-nighters. That's what happens at Albany now. They're at the boat, Big Ugly, um, and they're going to get through at least by Friday. We should have a final session update for you. Uh, Liz expects to be back in town by Monday. She'll be at her session on June 25th. Uh, later life planning series about palliative care, and on July 16th, we're going to have a session on for uh, scams. Thanks. Have a good summer. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Jack from Assembly Member C Rights Office. Um, as everyone has heard already, you know, go rent regulations, really great success. Um, also, as I was here, on my way here, we were learning that the assembly was passing legislation to um, better, uh, it was sexual harassment legislation to better protect people against that type of harassment um, all around the state. Um, they were also working on um, a farm bill where it protects all uh, New York State employees, um, giving them the same benefits as everyone else. Um, so those are great things that are happening, um, and there is still a lot to come, as Audrey has said, in these coming hours. Um, and uh, also something that I want to share is that the assembly member has been um, working with other assembly members uh, to pass legislation regarding the void, empty void space um, in tall buildings, which was brought up earlier today. Um, and a great movement on that is that the Firefighters Association of New York, I think of some sort, uh, created a memo and passed it along, and I believe we sent it to uh, you guys that they um, support the limiting of void space because they see it as a safety hazard. So that's a great win to have a group like firefighters who are there to keep us safe tell us that it's not safe to have these tall, empty spaces. Um, so we thought that was something great to share. Um, if you're interested in that, we can um, send that around as well. Um, but other than that, that's about it. So do you have any questions? Or Yeah? I understand um, Assemblywoman C. Wright is committed to the census as well, and that said, uh, hopefully you'll send somebody from your offices tomorrow to attend the meeting at 6.30 p.m. at CBA District Office 505 Park Avenue, because we need your input. All right. That's tomorrow. Thank you, Jack. All right. Hey, wait, wait, one more question. Yeah. So actually, it's a thank you to Rebecca and the heavy lifting that she did that three board members were put onto the REAC board, and we are so appreciative of all of her efforts to make that happen. Yeah, that's fun. I promise. But we got something done. All right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca. I am the new community liaison for Assemblymember Court's office. I know you've probably heard from Victoria in the past. Uh, she left the position because she moved to Texas, so very warm and nice weather. Uh, I just have a few things to talk about. Like I said, uh, stated previously, Assembly is going insane right now. Probably will end Friday, so we have a lot of great stuff passing through. Um, the Assembly member um, got his bill through, which is 8383. Um, it extends the real property tax abatement program for co-ops and condo units for two more years. It passed the Senate yesterday and is expected to be voted on by the Assembly anytime soon. So we will probably tweet about it on the Assembly member's account so you all can know that. Um, one bill is that I know Senator Kruger is holding up in the Senate. Um, it adds 92Y to a list of nonprofit institutions that are eligible for funding from DASNY, which is the Dormitory Authority of New York. They're planning to do some construction in the near future. We don't know how near, but when they do notify us, we will obviously notify all of you. Um, one last bill is that the assembly members bill that 
synchronizes multiple prescriptions to be refilled at the same time every month past the Senate Monday and is past the assembly and it's also heading to the governor's desk for his signature. So if you have multiple prescriptions that are set to be refilled at every other day of the month, they could all be set to one day so you don't have to go through all of that havoc. And then just, yes, clap, good medication stuff. Um, and then also last month, the uh, bill that legalizes gravity knives was signed by the governor last week. Gravity knives were in the penal law listed as a dangerous weapon. So we're very, very grateful that all that happened. It took seven long years in the making to finally get it passed into law and make them legal again. So yeah, that's all that I have for you. Any questions? Is the, is the extension of the abatement on the same terms as existing? Yeah, so just extending the program for two more years. Okay. Any other questions? Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll be fast. Okay, on homes, it's great that we don't have that building. I'm not so sure how great the next one is going to be. So I've already contacted Councilmember Kalos and, and trying to work together to um, ensure that it meets the community's needs. And uh, according to an article in the city, it is going to be 70-30, which I feel is punishment. 70-30 um, market rate versus 30% affordable housing, that that feels like punishment. So we have to keep an eye on that. Um, I, Barry and, and Peter Patch and I were lucky and had a six and a half hour afternoon and morning at Cornell Weill Medical School. And I know that the, um, the issue of the expansion of that hospital was an issue, I think, years ago for the community board. Barry, you look puzzled. Am I saying something wrong? No. But the research facilities there are so extraordinary that it literally took my breath away what they are able to do and what they are working on doing um, between patients and genes and microscopes and, and materials and equipment. And they're not large spaces, so each lab is kind of half of this desk in front of you. I just, I was so excited to be there and see what they are doing and listen to medical students that it was just a really exceptional day. And I wanted to let you know that the space is going to really good use. Um, the Esplanade, um, Barry went to a meeting of Friends of the Esplanade, and we will be emailing you around his report of that. For the Veterans Committee, we no longer have a Veterans Committee because we no longer have a chair. If there's anyone who is willing to volunteer to chair the Veterans Committee, um, the, the former chair, I think, will work with everyone. So send me an email about that. Is that a question, Barry? No, it's a volunteer. OK, just send me an email. May I just Barbara? say that David Menegon, who was the chair, is now a public member of yes. the Health Seniors Committee, and I'm hoping to do that he will bring in and do some um, veterans work through that committee. Okay, I also let him know that I was going to make this announcement if we could have a veterans committee. If not, we could run it through you, and that's fine. Um, there was a great forum the Women and Families Committee did last week with District Attorney Cy Vance, the head of, she came and spoke to us, and I invited her to come back um, about the new District Attorney's division to deal with sexual assault in the workplace, which is a crime. Harassment is not a crime, but at some point there is a line that may be crossed depending on it. And also I found out that every single employer basically in the state, even with one employee, needs to do sexual harassment training and that, that is a really good thing. They did a, an excellent job. Um, and, um, and Brenda Levin sent around um, a memo that Extel prepared in response to the issues and concerns and ideas raised by the community at our meeting back in, uh, I think it was May. So um, we'll send that around as well. Okay, um, Will, is there, did I say something? Okay, Will. I'll be very quick. Um, last Monday, we had a very exciting day in the board office. We had our newest staffer, the uh, part-time community associate position. Uh, she started, uh, Saida Harrigan. And uh, at the same day, we also had a JFU intern from Hunter College start for the summer internship. Uh, Sarah Mar is in the back, if she'll wave so you all see her and get to know her over this summer. She's incredible, uh, and, and we're so happy to have both of them on the team right now. Uh, they were actually able to go to the census workshop that was done last week, and uh, I hope they were very helpful uh, in everything they were doing. Um, and at the same time, they were also able to scramble and uh, get extra flyers up for the uh, uh, the, the meeting on Thursday, the, the forum. Women and Families Women Forum. Families. Thank you. Uh, and so we were able to get extra coverage of, on all the streets uh, going up and down the avenues. 
And uh, it was a very successful event, and they were very helpful in that, too. So just to give them a big welcome, and uh, hopefully you'll see them around soon. You reminded me. So there's a... One second, Laura. Well, I want yes. to thank you so much, you and your office, for really being there for the Census Task Force for both workshops. We really appreciate you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you so much. That means a lot. It was really well done. Um, I, I would like to say that I'm trying a new policy, which is because there's been some disagreement about the postering for various events and committee meetings. When you submit your minutes or your, or your actually not your minutes, your agenda for your meeting or your agenda for the uh, um, forum, please let Will know the area that you would like to see flyered, the avenues, the streets, if it's just intersections, so that there will be something that, um, that won't disappoint you. And, uh, and if it's too much for the office, they'll let you know. But in the meantime, I think it's a really good idea to just have you, you guys are so vested in what your committees do and in the forums that you present that it would be good if the flyering met your expectations and brought in as many possible people as we can, which is not to disparage the office, but I realize that there's sometimes a disagreement. Okay, landmarks, David and Jane. Take it away. First item is 80 East 93rd Street. This is a townhouse where they were uh, putting in a fence and uh, putting in planters and putting in new windows. This was a unanimous approval. Chuck? Call the question. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Call the roll. Aronson? Yes. Ashby? Yes. Barron? Yes. Barton? Yes. Birnbaum? Yes. Forrest? Yes. Brown? Here. Camp? Yes. Chalky? Yes. Chu? Yes. Cone? Yes. Dangor? Yes. Freeland? Yes. Hartside? Yeah. Yes. Hmm? Yes. Helpern? Yes. Higgins? Yes. King? Yes. Kirschenbaum? Yes. Later? Yes. Mason? Yes. Morris? Yes. Newman? Yes. Marshall? Yes. Pope Marshall? Yes. Price? Yes. Rosenstein? Yes. Rudder? Yep. Salcedo? Sanchez? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Spangoletti? Yes. Squire? Yes. Strongshinazaki? Yes. Mayo? Yes. Heidelbaum? Yes. Tejo? Yes. Fever? Wall? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Salcedo? Um. Item number three was withdrawn. That's 2068th Street. It was a unanimous disapproval. And they are going to come back to us in July, I guess, with a new application. So we'll just have number two, which was a sort of a, it, that was a motion to disapprove, sort of removing the symmetry from the front entrance by making one of the windows on either side of the front entrance a blind window. Um, you can read the resolution, a blind window means the window would be removed, but the black granite that would be installed in its place would be incised to sort of have the same dimensions of a window, but it would not be a window. In any case, um, there were three votes against the disapproval. Do one of you, um, Gail, do you want to speak to why you... Um well, I felt that the building beyond not being distinguished that having that change where they were still going to have some bit of a recession so be recessed a bit but you would not have the window being replaced and I think you walk by if you just look at all the black stone that frankly with or without a window it was not going to make very much difference. Thank you Gail. Michelle. Yeah, I voted for the disapproval. If you could picture a big front, a big um, entryway, and there may be a picture of it in here, I'm not sure. Uh, but if you could picture a big entryway and the with all granite around it and black granite, with the architect's intention of having a window on one side of it and a window on the other, the windows being a very significant dimension, and then the building is asking that you leave that one window, but you take this other window and you recess it a little bit and just fill it with black granite. Now, if you're looking at the entrance to that building and the bottom portion of that building, that is really creates a, a completely asymmetrical effect. There's no real benefit to it. 
it demeans the architect's intention and any merit that this building might have. So I, I don't see a rationale for approving uh, such a thing. And it was at the request of a retail tenant whose entrance is on the avenue and who may not be there in a few years, uh, so that may have a completely different requirement in a few years. I couldn't see doing such a permanent um, uh, restoration. Uh, to me, it had no merit at all. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, I think Michelle just alluded to it. The retail tenant who I guess this isn't on the retail tenant who occupies the space, the entrance to the retail shop or establishment is on Madison. They don't use that part of the rear of their space where the window is. So it's behind the existing window. There's like a what you'd think of as a piece of cardboard, so you can't look in. You don't look into the window. But it's really the retail tenant, apparently, as Michelle said, who didn't mind it being altered or wanted it altered in that way. Am I, I'm, ex, yeah. So basically just to avoid the need to have the cardboard there to keep it. Yeah. We don't know if it was necessarily cardboard. We don't really no, know. Okay. Whatever it was, you could not yeah. look in through the window, but the window is still there, matching the window on the other side of the entrance and lending the symmetry. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? Call the question. Thank you. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Call the roll. It's, it's a motion yes. to disapprove. Yes. 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 yes to the no. Yes, I know. I just want to make sure everyone else Thanks. Okay. No. Yes to the no. Aronson. Yes. Ashby. Yes. yes. Barron. No. Barton. Yes. Birnbaum. Uh, yes. Boris. Boris? No, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass. Um, <clears throat> Brown? No. Camp? Yes. Chalky? Yes. Chu? No. Hone? No. Dangor? Yes. Freeland? Uh, I'm going to pass. Hartside? Yes. Helpern? Yes. Higgins? No. King? Yes. Hirschenbaum? Yes. Later. No. Mason. No. This Morris. Yes. Newman. Yes. Marshall. Yes. Pope Marshall. No. Price. Yes. Rosenstein. Yes. Rudder. Yes. Salcedo. Sanchez. Yes. Schneider. Yes. Spangoletti. Yes. Squire. Yes. Strong Shinazaki. Yes. Tamayo. Yes. Teitelbaum. Yes. Tejo. No. Fever, Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. Okay, Freeland, yes. And uh, Bortz? Uh, no. No. Did I miss anybody? Okay, on the first one, it was unanimous um, 39 yeses, zero noes. Will's counting that one, so why don't we start Brett Barry? Trisha's not here, so it's up to you. Did she have the baby? I don't know. I saw her walking on First Avenue. Yes, I just heard her. And I was like, okay. All right, so Barbara, my ex did she have the baby? She didn't come back to me, but I assume we had. Okay, well, we all know that Trisha was going to have a baby, so now we know that she did. So yay for her. She had it? Yeah, Barbara knows. Do we have a name? Teddy. Teddy. Oh. Is that short for Theodore? Or? And I really, it was a long, I mean, I think she went in on Monday and didn't, didn't get it until last night, the, the tech said. So. Those first babies can be slow. <laughs> anyway, congratulations. She's got to rest. Congratulations to Trisha Barry. Thank you. Thank you. And good, yeah, good evening. We have a couple of resolutions. Uh, the first one is on the Honey Locust Park. Uh, that has been out of commission for about 10 years while the Department of Environmental Protection used it to, to create a you know, third water tunnel to the EDC. And it, it, it's now coming back to the Department of Parks, and they made a number of changes, many of, most of which the uh, committee thought were very well done. And we say we uh, re recommend that the park look into fencing around the plant area. Other than that, we approved the, rec the uh, recommendation from the Department of Parks, so that then when the vote was 10 0 0. Yes. Motion to approve. Sure. Well, 
The only thing, okay, so I'll just, let me just describe the second one. Um, we call the 72nd Street Overlook is a dead end at the east end of 2nd Avenue, overlooking the, the Esplanade and the river, and uh, is in very, very bad shape. It's, it has not been maintained. It took, it took a long time, and Greg's help to find, uh, um, yes, Mr. Kirschenbaum's help, to find out who owns the property. Because Park was saying it's DOT, DOT was saying it's Park. It's, it's DOT. So what we're asking is the DOT to uh, uh, re fix up the park now with the pavers and the benches. But the second resolution uh, suggests that we ask the Department of Transportation and Parks to establish a me memorandum of understanding so that the park can be responsible as a joint owner of the property. And those are the three resolutions. Now, call, call question and call, all in favor? Second. You have a question, David? Yeah, just a point of information. The uh, minutes don't really dis describe where Honey Locust Park is. Oh. For those who aren't familiar with it, maybe you could just. Yes, it's on 59th Street between 1st and 2nd uh, on, the, on, on the south side of the bridge. But on the north side of 59th north side Street. Of the north side of 59th, of course, it's in our district. And that, I'll tell you about that some other time. There's a whole story behind that, but it's still in our district. It's a, it's a call. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Call the roll, please. Are we taking all three, Barry? Yes. All three. Okay. A yes is a yes. All right. Aronson? Yes. Ashby? Yes. Barron? Yes. Parton? Yes. Birnbaum? Yes. Boris? Yes. Brown? Yes. Camp? Yes. Chalky? Yes. Chu? Yes. Cone? Yes. Dangor? Yes. Freeland? Yes. Hartzog? Yes. Helpern? Yes. Higgins? Yes. King? Yes. Kirschenbaum? Yes. Later? Yes. Mason? Yes. Morris? Yes. Newman? Yes. Marshall? Yes. Pope Marshall? Yes. Price? Yes. Rosenstein? Yes. Rudder? Yes. Salcedo? Sanchez? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Spangoletti? Yes. Squire? Yes. Strong Shinazaki? Yes. Tamayo? Yes. Teitelbaum? Yes. Tejo? Yes. Fever? Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Thank you. Zimmerman? Oh, yes. Thank you. So vote on the, uh, the landmarks resolution about the window were 29 yeses and 10 noes. We're going to do budget first because Abraham is running late, and if Abraham is still running late, then cause it's up to you, right? Is it? it is. <laughs> Thank you. But we'll hear from Barbara first, and maybe he'll show up with wings on his feet. Okay. Whoops. Okay. Now it, this was this was the internal budget. That means the budget the community board eight spends internally, and this this is really a projected budget, as you just heard. Um, one of the council members gave their report. We got extra money, so there's going to be other money. And there's other questions that we weren't clear about yet. So the budget is an ongoing thing, and it will, any major changes will come back to the full board to vote on again. But right now, this is a mod so it will be modified. The budget is going to be is 254384 That's without our rent and utilities, that that's paid by directly by the city. I think our rent is probably the highest in, this, in the city because we're on Park Avenue, but, that, <laughs> but so it's a little different than the city, and we have great space, we still have great space. So the budget is on the floor, you all have copies on your... Call the question. Second, all in favor calling the question? Aye. Please call the roll. Aronson. Yes. Ashby. Yes. Barron. Yes. Barton. Yes. Birnbaum. Yes. Boris. Yes. Brown. Yes. Camp. Yes. Chalky. Yes. Chu. Yes. Cohn. Yes. Dangor. Yes. Freeland. Yes. Hartzog. Yes. Helper. Yes. Higgins. Yes. King. Yes. Kirschenbaum. Yes. Later. Yes. Mason. Yes. Morris. Yes. <laughs> Newman. Yes. Parshall. Yes. Pope Marshall. Yes. Price. Yes. Rosenstein. Yes. Rudder. Yes. Salcedo? Sanchez? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Spagnoletti? Yes. Squire? Yes. Strong Shinazaki? Yes. Tamayo? Yes. Teitelbaum? Yes. Tejo? Yes. Fever? Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. And I want to thank Rebecca for doing the minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, on the three parts resolutions, it was unanimous, 39 yeses, zero noes. And the same for the budget committee, thank you. Okay, so Abraham is in here. We do need to do street life. Is, are you volunteering, Cause? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you still, still have to do them. We still have to vote. Okay. Anybody on? Uh, Chuck? The DCA and yeah. DCA um, Well, for four A, you'll have to pull out. The, yeah. Well, four A pulls out, not voting for cause. We're calling out four A. Yes. Got it. Uh, yes. I do, I, I do not object to include the DCA. I was one of the person that. Died. I abstain. Okay, so everything is unanimous. I don't know. You had to ask yes, someone else. Uh, Lorraine. 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 No. For number 3C. Yeah. 3C. Um, I approve it. Okay, so everything is unanimous except 4A. Uh, just okay. a point of information. Yes. Uh, what is the reason for the, uh, uh, the abstention? abstention? Not voting for cause. No. Not but what is the cause? Financial. I'm, I'm part of uh, in there. I'm in the um, corporation. Okay. That, they said we have, we're required yes. to say why. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm fine. Is when we but can't we take that and you just... Yes, yes it is. We're oh, taking okay. everything. So everything is... We're voting on everything at once. Everything at once. Except we have to call 4A separately because you're not voting for cause and that needs to be noted. So let's just but, treat it separately. Okay. Okay. Why can't you just vote well, he's going to vote not voting for cause. On the whole thing. I, you know what? I think for procedural purposes, we're just going to do it this way. It's we're very. This is the last thing that we're doing unless okay. there's old business or new business. So let's just do it right. Thank you. All right, let's do it. Aronson. Yes. Ashby. Yes. Barron. Yes. Barton. Yes. Birnbaum. Yes. Forrest. Yes. Brown. Yes. Camp. Yes. Chalky. Yes. Chu. Yes. Cone. Yes. Dangor. Yes. Freeland, yes. Hartzog, yes. Helper, yes. Higgins, uh, yes. King, yes. Kirschenbaum, yes. Later, yes. Mason, yes. Morris, yes. Newman, yes. Marshall, yes. Pope Marshall, yes. Price, yes. Rosenstein, yes. Rudder, Rudder, Barbara, uh, yes. Thank you. Salcedo, Sanchez, yes. Schneider, yes. Spagnoletti, yes. Squire, yes. Strong Sinizaki. Strong is that? Lynn. All right. Thank you. Uh, Tamayo? Yes. Tetelbaum? Yes. Tejo? Yes. Fever? Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. And 4A? 4A, call the question. 4A. Call. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All approved? <laughs> Shall we do Thank it? Thank you, Cos. <laughs> All right. Aronson? Yes. Ashby? Yes. Barron? Yes. Barton? Yes. Birnbaum, yes. Boris, yes. Brown, yes. Camp, yes. Chalky, yes. Chu, yes. Cohn, yes. Dangor, yes. Freeland, yes. Hartzog, yes. Helpern, yes. Higgins, yes. King, yes. Kirschenbaum, yes. Later, yes. Mason, yes. Morris, yes. Newman, yes. Parshall, yes. Pope Marshall, yes. Price, yes. Rosenstein, yes. Rudder, yes. Salcedo, Sanchez, yes. Schneider, yes. Spangoletti? Not voted for cause, financial reasons. Thank you. <laughs> Squire? Yes. Trunks and Yes. Tamayo? Yes. Tatabon? Yes. Tejo? Yes. Fever? Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. Okay. okay, unanimous on all of the other street life resolutions. Any old business? Any new business? Second. Okay, have a great month. And, and hope the rain stops. Do something, please. <laughs>